This episode of Into the Cosmos is sponsored by Ecto Secure Cyber. You know, cybersecurity is something that I take very seriously with Into the Cosmos because you never know when you're going to get hacked by some, as Donald Trump put it, 400 pounder at home, or if you're going to be infected with a virus or have some sort of DDoS attack against your mainframe. Security is very important. But one thing you don't hear about enough is spiritual security. I mean, we all know that people, places, and even objects can be haunted by spirits, whether those are former human spirits or entities from some other realm entirely. What Ecto Secure Cyber provides is a full suite of services to both protect your online presence from these spirits and also to help exercise these spirits when they are detected. I've run Ecto Secure Cyber on my own system for many years now, and I highly recommend it. You can go to Ecto Secure Cyber's website and use the code word into the cosmos and receive a 50% discount for yourself. Now on today's episode of Into the Cosmos, we're going to look at something that has been a bit of a long-held urban legend or conspiracy theory in our culture, which I assure you is very much real. Now, we've all heard legends about inventors coming up with new and innovative devices that are going to in some way disrupt the current social order, whether that's someone coming up with innovative new green technology solutions or long-term power storage The power companies and the oil companies, they don't like when these things happen. And they do everything they can to fight it. They'll work with your municipality. They'll work with governments of all levels to regulate these sorts of new technologies out of business. And of course, politicians on either side of the argument will bring up the tremendous loss of jobs and these sorts of things. Of course, you know, jobs are valuable above all else. Let's ignore the fact of, you know, whether or not these jobs are destructive to the environment or the society or the mental health of our people. We got to keep those jobs numbers up. Now, this particular urban legend I'm talking about involves the discovery of a new carburetor that will make a car so fuel efficient that they'll effectively use less than 10% of the fuel that a traditional car would use today. At least this is the version of the legend we've been told. It's not quite what really happened. I'd like you to join me, Scott Michael Swank, on a journey into the cosmos forbidden realms to find out more. I think we've all at some point heard the urban legend about this innovative carburetor that only uses 10% of the fuel of a conventional carburetor. I mean, of course, it's 2016. We've moved well beyond carburetors and fuel injection is the norm and yada, yada, yada. But that doesn't matter for what I'm about to tell you because, well, it turns out the fancy carburetor was never a real invention at all. And that the real innovation, the real solution to our energy problems was swept under the rug 40 years ago. And it all ties back to an American inventor named Tabitha Ping. In the early 1970s, Tabitha Ping was a student at MIT. She was a middling student. I mean, she was at MIT, so clearly she was quite intelligent, but She hasn't really done anything noteworthy in her career, except for what I'm about to tell you. You have to understand that the biggest source of inefficiency in any internal combustion car, and not even just internal combustion, this applies to electric cars or really anything that runs on a rubber tire, comes from the rubber tires. When tires rub on the ground, they create heat and friction and noise and that's where most of the energy that you're getting out of your fuel is going to the energy is effectively being 
rubbed into the road through heat and through noise. This is especially apparent if you're in a cold climate like I am and you are a winter driver and you throw on your snow tires before the first snowfall and you just hear the deafening sound of your tires as they roll down the street. Now, snow tires and their effectiveness are another episode entirely. If the show continues to run, we can talk about that scam when we get there. You see, in the 1970s, Miss Ping had invented a new tire that wasn't reliant upon rubber at all. In fact, it was made out of that most precious material for the creation of the United States and much of the world that is now demonized and banned, hemp. Miss Pingy, as she was pejoratively known by her co-workers due to her unfortunate size and affection for green frogs, had invented an entirely new tire that was both silent and heatless. It didn't create friction when it rolled on the asphalt. It maintained its grip, but it allowed the car to glide effortlessly from one point to another. Cars running on Miss Pingy's hemp tires would use around 8.5% of the fuel that the same car would use using a conventional rubber tire. Furthermore, these tires were relatively inexpensive, coming in at about $20 per tire in 1973 dollars. They could fit on any rim, and they could be made at any size. You know, they could have made these tires for dump trucks and monster trucks and mine trucks and small cars, smart cars, bicycles, you know, anything that uses a rubber tire. And so you have to ask yourself, if it's more fuel efficient, if it's cheaper, if it's quieter, if it's in every measure better than the rubber tire, what happened to Miss Pingy and her hemp tires? Unfortunately, Miss Pingy's tire wasn't isolated from the political climate of the United States in the early 70s. Let's not forget that in 1971, President Richard Nixon formally introduced the War on Drugs, which was primarily targeting marijuana, which, if you're unaware, happens to be the exact same plant as hemp, hemp being a non-psychoactive variety used for clothing and rope and practical purposes. And so with the War on Drugs, Miss Piggy's tire was fighting an uphill battle. But that wasn't the only front on which she was fighting that battle. You see, the oil companies, those that supplied American gas stations with that ever so important and expensive fluid that we all use daily in our vehicles, they stood to lose a lot of money if every car was suddenly, you know, ten times more fuel efficient. And so they did their part. They launched a campaign targeting hemp tires, saying that they were unsafe, that if a young child ran out in front of your car and you slammed on the brakes, your hemp tires would disintegrate as they ground against the asphalt and, well, you'd plow right into those children and that'd be the end of them and very likely would be the end of you as well. Actual safety testing from the time shows that hemp tires actually stopped an average of five feet before their rubber-tired brethren would stop in the same vehicle at the same speed, and that hemp tires were at least four times more resilient to things like nails in the road or even impacts from bullets or other projectiles. Also joining the fight against Miss Pingy and her phenomenal new invention was Big Rubber. You know, rubber is one of the most important exports from India. And to have vehicles suddenly stop using rubber in their tires would mean an almost total collapse of India's economy. 
And so the government of India, then headed by Raj Pungandi, fought very hard to keep rubber exports where they were, to provide rubber to tire manufacturers in the United States and Europe and China at a lower cost than hemp producers in America or China or Canada could possibly ever deliver at. The rubber tire, while being worse in every way, was a required choice for the elites that ran the economies of India and America and Europe and elsewhere. And so the rubber tire remains to this day. But whatever happened to the hemp tire? Whatever happened to Miss Pingy? Whatever happened to this new manufacturing process? Ultimately, the hemp tire became a pipe dream, something that was inachievable. The effect that the war on drugs and overall banning of hemp production in the U.S. had on Miss Pingy's invention was absolute. No hemp tires are manufactured in the United States or elsewhere to this day. Mass production effectively never happened. You know, every now and again I dream that a billionaire philanthropist and Elon Musk or a Tesla will come along and remove the wool from all of our eyes and show us the tremendous benefit we would all achieve from using hemp tires, but I'm skeptical that that will ever happen. I'm skeptical that the elites and the powers that be will ever let that happen. You know, I always hate ending an episode like this on such a downer moment, but there's really no opportunity for optimism in this scenario. Perhaps my call for someone to champion this cause will not go unheard, but for some reason I doubt it. Until next time, I'm Scott Michael Swank, and this was Into the Cosmos, Forbidden Realms.